Those who believe elections should be about issues and the willingness of candidates to engage voters on issues that matter to our country and our communities. I think it's safe to say this has been a difficult year and is likely to not, it's not likely to get any less difficult as the election approaches. On the other hand, political discourse has been difficult for many years now. Making democracy work is not a cause for the faint-hearted uh, or for those looking for easy, quick solutions. And no one knows that better than our next speaker, Joel Goldman. He is with the Democracy Fund, which was created to respond to a troubling array of issues facing our nation's political system. The fund adheres to three core commitments, that the American people must have the ability to make informed choices as they engage in civ the civic life of their nation and their communities, that they must have confidence that their voices are the primary influence shaping the outcome of policy debates, and that they need to know that their government has the ability to solve important problems despite deep differences of opinions which sounds an awful lot like the League of Women Voters. And we look forward to deepening our collaboration with Joel and with the fund. So with that, would you please join me in, web in welcoming Joe Goldman. Thank you. Um, thank you. Um, it's really a wonderful opportunity to be here. I've been a, such a big fan of the League for so many years too. And, Cheryl has been telling me about these conventions for so many years to, to actually be here is, is a really great honor. Um, so um, as you heard, I, I run a foundation created by the founder of eBay, um, and our focus really is how to make sure that the American public comes first in our democracy. Um, we're relatively new, um, but over the last few years we have committed more than $30 million to organizations working um, to strengthen our political system. Um, and before I kind of get into what I wanted to say, uh, since you, we were just talking about money and politics, I actually wanted to say a couple words about that. Um, uh, you know, to me, the, the most interesting um, state-based model that, that I've seen responding to one of the questions really is the New York City um, small donor public financing model that right, matches small donor contributions at a six to one basis. Um, but you know, I, while, while that is an ideal in many ways, I think we need to recognize that that has not been replicated um, around the country at, at a great level, right? And I think we really need to think about what are the politics in red states and blue states and purple states and what does that mean for the possibility of making progress on this issue. Um, you know, what, one of the organizations that we've provided funding for is a group called Take Back Our Republic, which is actually an organization of conservatives who care about campaign finance reform, right? The, the guy who runs it um, is actually, so if you remember a few years ago, Eric Cantor lost re-election because he wasn't conservative enough. Uh, <laughs> So the, the guy who ran that campaign runs Take Back Our Republic. So you can't question his credentials as a conservative. They are coming at this issue from an authentically conservative point of view. And I think we need to pay attention to how do we broaden the policy coalitions working on these issues so that we can actually make progress, right? Um, and then, you know, another grantee, the, the, wherever the, the league from Oregon is, uh, somewhere in the room, over here. Um, so, I mean, you guys are well aware of the Citizens Initiative Review in Oregon, right? Um, so a few years ago, the state signed into law a process by which when ballot referendums were, would come forward that were particularly controversial, um, the state would actually convene a randomly selected group of citizens to hear testimony and deliberate about these ballot measures and then insert into the voter guide what this demographically representative group of citizens thought of the initiative. And all the research on this, uh, the CIR, shows that people actually pay attention to it. It actually matters in how people vote on these ballot measures. And that's not taking money in politics kind of head on. It's not capping how much money is going in, but it's kind of trying to make an end run, right? If, if we can't reduce the number of commercials that a super PAC is running, maybe we can reach citizens in person before they're voting in an authentic way that matters to them. And so I, I think we need to think about beyond just let's, let's 
amend the Constitution, let's, let's, um, let's overturn Citizen United, I think we actually need to think about what are the different range of possibilities we can do to take on these issues. So I wasn't going to talk about that, but felt a need to <laughs> say it. Uh, so, um, you know, when, people tell, when, when, when I tell people what I do for a living, right, I, I run a foundation focused on making democracy work better, um, I get two reactions, and I think these may be familiar to you. Um, so the first is, is heartfelt, right? It, it is, thank God. Thank God someone is doing this work. Um, and, and I imagine that the League gets that quite a bit. Um, what the League may also get is the second reaction I hear a lot, right, which is, you're working to, to fix our democracy? Good, good luck with that. Um, and, you know, both of those reactions make a lot of sense, right, because the challenges facing our political system feel so great, feel so overwhelming at times, it can be hard to feel optimistic, right? Um, lately, I've been telling people that I understand I think I understand at least what it must feel like to be a climate scientist who for the last two decades, you know, has been raising the alarm, right? You, you should pay attention to carbon levels. It's gonna be bad for the planet. Um, and now for, for that scientist to read the reports and read the headlines and actually see supercharged weather and, and rising sea levels, it must, you know, on, on one hand, you gotta feel like there's kind of a, a well, told you so, um, right? <laughs> Um, but what a horrible way to feel right. And, and, and it must feel strange to actually see what you've been worried about for years actually coming to pass. And, you know, for me, that resonates because, you know, for the last couple decades, you know, I and so many others, many, many in this room, have been expressing concern about what it means in a democracy when you have low public trust in political institutions for too long. Right, scary things happen. And I, and I look around in 2016 and start feeling like that climate scientist a little bit, right? Um, you know, and it's not just about the, the primary election in 2016 election, but look around, I mean, think about what happened with the Oregon militia and that, the takeover of that federal property, right? That's, that's one end of the spectrum. And think about what's been happening with police violence and the emergence of Black Lives Matter and the degree to which a substantial portion of our public feels completely abandoned by an important institution of our government, right? Um, the public needs to believe that they're better off because of our democratic institutions. Um, they need to have some reason to have faith. You know, it's no surprise that a significant portion of the candidates um, who did well in, in the election this year so far have not been part of the establishment, right? People are not coming out for mainstream candidates and it's because they feel a sense of betrayal, right? They feel a sense of being let down by our political system. And they have a right to be angry. There's, there's, I don't think anybody in this room would, would disagree with that. But we cannot let it come to pass that people give up on our core democratic institutions. Um, you've all heard the statistics. I don't need to share many of them, right? You know the low level of, of support for Congress and political leaders in Washington. You've heard them a million times. Um, you know, a few of the statistics that jump out for me, right, um, you know, 46% of the public, according to a recent Pew poll, said that America today is worse than it was 50 years ago for people like them. Right? That's nearly one in two people who don't see a better world for their children and grandchildren. Two in ten Americans say they are angry at the federal government, while nearly six in ten say they're frustrated. And the one that really hits home for me, um, nearly two-thirds of Americans believe they're on the losing side. Right? Two-thirds, when they think about their families, their jobs, their communities, they feel like more often than not they're on the losing side of how things come out, rightfully or not. And it's no wonder people are angry and losing faith when they have that sensibility. And you know, my concern is, right, does 2016, does the time we are living in right now, does that represent a tipping point? Um, 
David, Rook, David Brooks recently wrote a, a powerful column um, that I'd recommend to you all. Um, in it, he argued that in a large, complex country like ours, there are two ways to get things done. Politics and some form of dictatorship. And here's what he wrote. The downside of politics is that people never really get everything they want. It's messy. Do you know anything about that? Yeah. Um, uh, it's messy, limited, and no issue is ever really settled. Disappointment is normal. But that's sort of the beauty of politics. It involves an endless conversation in which we learn about the other people and try to balance their needs against our own. Plus, it's better than the alternative, ruled by some authoritarian tyrant who tries to govern by clobbering everyone on, in his way. Right? You know, thankfully, our founders chose politics, but I worry that too many people are increasingly open to the other route. Many Americans no longer believe the system's working for us, and they need something to believe in. So what does that mean for us, for those of us who care about our democracy? For me, the first thing is we need to find ways to put people back in the center of our democracy to give them the visceral experience of what it means to be a citizen, for what it means to be connected to government. Um, and let, let me tell you a story to try to illustrate what I mean. So um, almost 20 years ago, um, kind of early, early stages of my career, I was working for um, the new mayor of Washington, D.C., Tony Williams, um, who was kind of elected as the anti-Marion Barry, right, as the kind of wonky, nerdy, anti-politician. Um, who needed to figure out how to reestablish some level of faith in local government. Um, so we designed this process we called Neighborhood Action in which we tried to put citizens in the center of driving the overall city's priorities. So if you imagine the cycle, we would um, create a strategic plan for the city involving all the agencies. That would lead into the creation of the city's budget which would lead into the creation of performance contracts for every agency director, which would lead into creation of a public scorecard to transparently say, this is what government's doing. And the public's priorities were driving every stage of that cycle, right? So the, the core of this process, we would convene these things we called citizen summits. So we'd bring together thousands and thousands of DC residents representing the actual demographics of the city they would sit down at tables with diverse groups and trained facilitators and try to find common ground as they, they wrestled with the priorities and choices facing the city. Um, and so for me, you know, the, one of the most poignant uh, moments of my career, at, at the end of the first of these citizen summits, um, this activist from over on North Capitol Street, he ran a, a community development corporation. He came up to me at the end of one of these citizen summits with honestly tears in his eyes and gave me this big hug, right? This, this gruff activist gave, gave me this big hug and, 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 and said, I've never actually felt heard like I did today, right? And that, that's, that's the experience we need to figure out how to give people to feel connected to our democracy in a way that they feel heard and they feel their voices are going to mean something. And that's not just about elections, that is about democracy every day, right? Um, that's why the, the Democracy Fund has been a big supporter of something called participatory budgeting. Um, over the last several years, cities around the country have started adopting this practice in which a small portion of city budgets are given over to the public to decide what to do with. Um, New York City has been at the forefront of this and um, you know, every city councilor um, gives some, number, some amount of money available to their residents in their constituents to decide what to do with. And all the research says that matters a lot. It changes the relationship between citizens and their government. Similarly, my team that works on local journalism has been thinking about how does the fact that the entire media world has been kind of disrupted and transformed, where, do we, where can we actually find an opportunity there? And the opportunity, I think, is you know, two decades ago in the 90s and the 80s, when, when there was a public journalism movement, there was a movement to try to get media to connect with the public in a different way. All of those efforts failed, and I think in part because there was little incentive for journalists to change how they operated, right? Their, their, their um, 
ad dollars were coming in and subscription dollars were coming in the same way they used to. That's not the case anymore. If media doesn't change how they act, they are going to die. And there is an incentive, especially at the local level, for media to find ways to have a real relationship with the, their communities and to actually be a venue for the community to understand itself and to convey what it believes to those who make decisions. Um, and that, that's where we're focusing a lot of our work related to the future of journalism. Um, the League has always played a critical role in creating venues for the public to come together and make their voices heard. And I think, I think now is the time you need to double down on that work. The second thing I think we need to do is find creative ways to hold the line against those who believe that facts no longer matter. <laughs> so, it, you know, it's, it's easy to watch certain candidates running for office today and their rampant disregard for the truth and become dismayed about our political discourse. But the health of democracy requires that we not cede facts to those who hold them in such low regard. We need to find creative ways to make sure that facts will continue to matter, whether it's through news literacy for young people, reviving local journalism, or finding ways to create real consequences for disregarding facts. Four years ago, the Democracy Fund worked with the League of Women Voters to pressure television stations to reject campaign ads that were misleading, local television stations making the case. And, and it, it mattered. It, we did see some movement. The Democracy Fund has also made major investments in the field of fact-checking, not because we believe that another pants on fire rating from PolitiFact is going to stop Donald Trump from saying whatever the hell he wants to say, <laughs> but because we want to change the culture of journalism to give journalists the space to feel the courage to actually call out lies when they see them and not fall back and not fall back on this notion of kind of he said, she said journalism where from a point of objectivity, we can't actually call balls and strikes. Um, we funded some research a couple of years ago um, from a professor at Dartmouth and, and we actually found that when, when a candidate knew that they were being fact-checked, fact when they knew fact-checking was there, there was actually a statistically significant difference in the level of deception that, that the fact-checkers were hearing. So, you know, does that mean that there are no lies? No. I mean, this is politics. It just happens, right? <laughs> but, but it does make a difference. Um, so, you know, the League of Women Voters has always been a champion of factual reason debate in our democracy. And it's more important than ever that you maintain that role. But I also want to note some other research we, we did showed that there was a significant partisan difference between Democrats and Republicans in terms of what readers, the degree to which readers actually believed the fact checkers. Um, and that actually says something about the echo chambers that we live in today, right? We're all used to just hearing the things that just reify what we already believe, but it also has something to do with the degree to which people have lost trust in different ways in, in, in different institutions of our democracy. And if we're going to win this fight, we need to find ways to speak to people in language that they can hear, which means actually thinking about, for a conservative, what, is it, what, what brings credibility to a fact-checking regime, right? How do we speak to people in a language they can hear? Um, and that's, that goes to kind of my last point, right, is that the League of Women Voters has always played a vital role in creating space where people can reach across the aisle across the divide and try to find common ground, to try to understand each other as human beings who are just trying to solve problems, trying to get things done, right? Um, this is hard work. It's not supposed to be easy. It's going to be uncomfortable. Um, but, you know, in, in, again, before my days at the Democracy Fund, I, I helped run this organization called America Speaks, um, and we would convene these massive town meetings around the country on all sorts of issues. Um, and more often than not, I would have, at any given table, some folks from Move On and some folks from the Tea Party sitting down together. Um, and you would expect you would need to kind of bring the ambulances after such a thing. <laughs> but, but that's not what would happen, right? Because when you give people a clear task, when you give people a problem to solve, when you give them information that they need to make reasoned decisions, 
And when you help to humanize the other, when you help people to understand that the person across the table is not the devil, um, he or she is not Hitler, right? This is another person who's just trying to get by. They can solve problems. Um, and, and I've seen it countless times. And, you know, that is a role that the League of Women Voters has played in the past and needs to continue to play in the future. Um, so lots of other things I can talk about <laughs> related to our democracy, but, um, you know, I, I guess I just wanted to leave you um, with this quote. Um, so uh, there, there was an early Federalist leader named Fisher Ames who um, talked a bit about the difference between democracy and an, author an, uh, an authoritarian government. So here's what he said. He said, monarchy is like a sleek craft. It sails along well until some bumbling captain runs it into the rocks. <laughs> Democracy, on the other hand, is like a raft. It never goes down, but damn it, your feet are always wet. <laughs> so, you know, I think lately, lately all of our feet have felt pretty wet. Um, but, you know, thanks to organizations like the League of Women Voters, I'm confident that we're not going to run into the rocks. Um, so thank you for, for all that you do. I'm glad that we can be a, a partner in this overall mission to save our democracy. So. I open up the, I know that there are questions and before I open this up for questions I did have one my, myself because yes. I know that you have been very involved in, in in bringing a lot of these systems or a lot of these complexities together and try in, 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 in an attempt to literally map some of these um, some of these systems and some of the complexities in our democracy could you talk a little bit about how that works and what are what your goals are in a, your democracy mapping project sure um, um, so yeah if you, if you go to the democracy funds website um, and click on the approach tab um, you'll see that um, one of the things that we th I think there are two things that distinguish our work right one is that we really try to approach it from a bipartisan stance and the other is that we've adopted this thing called systems thinking. And what systems thinking means is that when you operate in a complex world, there aren't actually straight lines between point A and point B because there's so many interdependencies um, that whenever you make an intervention, you're gonna get pushback and you need to expect that. Um, and so the, you know, there are a few things that that, that the, the kind of the big guideposts for us are there are no easy answers. When you think you got an easy answer, you're probably wrong. There are no silver bullets, right? There's not the one thing. It's not just the super PACs. It's not just redistricting. It's not just gerrymand. You know, it, it, it's, it's all of these things. Um, but the fact that it's all of these, of these things doesn't mean we can drive them all forward at the same time. We need to actually think really hard about where within a system there is leverage, right? Where can we actually move, make a small move that's gonna have big impacts? Um, and, you know, for us, you know, when you think about our journalism work, we, we are not trying to save the old business model of journalism. We've accepted that that's, that's on its way out. But we're trying to figure out, in the context of major um, market forces that are driving that industry, how can we actually take advantage of those forces in order to not get back what we're losing, but to rather create something new that preserves the things that are most important for our democracy, right? And I, I think that is an important orientation. I think too often in the political reform space, um, in order to get supporters to back us, we oversimplify the argument. Mm -hmm. Um, and that raises a false sense of expectation about what we can achieve when, you know, whether we're talking about um, McCain-Feingold or the Help America Vote Act, uh, legislation that is very good and important, but when we get that legislation passed, the game isn't over, we haven't solved our democracy because you can't solve our democracy 
democracy is complicated and it requires ongoing engagement. And I think that really drives and informs how we, how we work. And I'm sorry, I have got to ask this question, so everybody be patient. For an organization that advocates in legislative bodies and struggles often with really intractable, intractable problems, I'm going to use the example of redistricting reform. Yeah. Um, how would you, where, where do you see based on um, the work that you have done so far that an organization like the League, I know you've mentioned letting people, letting people have places where they can feel their voices are heard um, and, and, and a number of other really important things that, that resonate with the League, but we're still out there in that reform space trying to, trying to solve those intractable problems. Where do, you see, how, where do you see the best place or how do we locate the leverage or where, the, where that spot is where we're not oversimplifying, but we are moving the conversation forward. Yeah, I, um, I don't know that I have a, a great satisfying answer for that. Um, you know, we, we are a relatively young organization. We, we kind of became an independent private foundation two years ago. And um, one of the things that we've been doing in, in, in partnership with some of staff from the league and, and many of your allies is, is trying to map these systems to get a sense for leverage. Um, and, you know, we're just in the process of producing these maps that you'll, you can find up on our website and trying to decipher within these maps where we can find leverage. So, I mean, our hope is that along with you and many other partners, we can, we can really try to give our best sense of, of where, where we can find that leverage. So, so I don't have the answer, but hopefully with you, we can find it. Um. In that case, I, um, thank you all for being patient. Uh, and I'm gonna start with questions on microphone one. Oh, wow. Hi, I'm Linda Garvelink from uh, the League of Women Voters of Falls Church, Virginia. Um, often, I sometimes hope this is just my conservative friends, but I often hear that the, the League is democratic with a big D, or that we're liberal leaning. And from what, do you hear that? That's my first question. Number two, is it bad? And number three, <laughs> is F so, what do we do about it? Um, do, I, do I think that the brand of the league is perceived as on the center left? Yeah. Um, I, to be, I'm sorry, Cheryl, if I wasn't supposed to say that. But, um, uh, you know, I think, I think there is an assumption that the political reform community in the highly polarized environment that we're in is assumed to be coming from the center left. And, you know, in a, in a highly polarized environment, if you think government is, is a good thing, you may be center left. Um, it's a little, little concerning. Um, I don't, I, I, guess, I guess I'd say two things. Um, while there is some of that perception, I think the League also has an important brand that is perceived as a place where folks can come together, right? And, um, and I think that is unique in this world and is something that the League needs to fight for. Um, I, don't, I don't think it's a good or a bad to be bipartisan or partisan. I think we all play different roles in our political system. And there is an important role that not enough are playing that is in that kind of bipartisan, more neutral convener space that once you move away from, you can't get back. Um, and so to the extent that the league were ever to choose to move away from that, you gotta be very careful because you're not gonna be able to revisit that decision. Um, so uh, so I, I'd just say one more thing, which is that the Democracy Fund has struggled with this issue, um, and we've actually gone out of our way to hire Republican staff and put Republicans on our National Advisory Committee. And you know, we fund we fund Common Cause and Rock the Vote, and you know, those kinds of traditional good government organizations. We also fund the Cato Institute because it's important to broaden that coalition. Um, and I, those are hard choices to make, and and I don't think there's a simple answer to finding your way through it. Microphone two. Uh, Mary Ann Barnes from Greater Cleveland. Um, I would like to revisit a question that I had of our first speaker at this uh, uh, convention and um, would like to hear what you think of the role of um, civics education in our primary and secondary schools 
And if, uh, and then I put sort of a wrinkle that kind of relates to what you said today, is if, if there's a role there for um, helping young people deal with this whole um, political discourse issue. I think someone commented that one of the reasons that young people don't want to talk about politics is that they don't want to learn that they disagree with their close buddy. And um, so I'd like to throw that question to you. Yeah, I, I, I wish I could give a better answer on this one. It's, it's not an area that I have a lot of expertise in. Um, it comes up a lot in our work. Um, and I, you know, it's, it's an obvious conclusion that one reaches when one looks at what's going on in the world. Um, it's a long play, right? And I guess the question is, how urgent do you think the crisis is right now? Um, you know, the civic education may make a difference over the course of 10 or 20 years. Um, and I think it's important to pay attention to and think about but it's not gonna, it's not gonna pay dividends in the short term, right? Um, and so, we all, with our kind of finite resources, need to um, figure out how urgent um, are, is the problem that we're responding to, um, and the degree to which we just need to give up on the current generation and focus on the next generation. <laughs> um, uh, I could argue either side of that debate. Um, <laughs> Um, but uh, you know, I, I think it's it's definitely worth paying attention to. But um, but uh, it's not it's not an area I have a lot of expertise in. Microphone three. Hi, Helen Gagel from the League in Evanston, Illinois. Um, you gave us some encouraging words about efforts that you were funding and other efforts to move what I would call people toward discernment. I mean, we could be called the League of Discerning Voters. <laughs> Because that's it's what we not, are. It's not the sexiest name, but yes. <laughs> <laughs> but could you talk a little bit more about how to move people, particularly the younger voters, um, who seem to move into one camp or the other very, very quickly, um, move them closer to discernment before they get to discord, as opposed to trying to move them in the other direction, which is much harder, as you said in your example of yeah. putting move on and tea party at the same table. Yeah, so I'll, I guess I'll say two things to that. Um, one is, I think, the experience of face-to-face -face engagement matters, right? That you can't replicate the experience of sitting down and grappling with somebody who you think is on the other side and actually finding that you actually share core values. Face-to-face right? -face instead of Facebook. Um, <laughs> I, you know, I think for the time being, until we come the, to the next generation of technology where we're all in holograms and we're, act, you know. Um, th that said, so just to give you an example, so, so we, um, on the other hand, um, so one of the grantees we support is a group in Texas called the Engaging News Project. And they focus on running lab and field experiments in partnership with media to find different ways you could tweak how media present information online that has some kind of democratic benefit but also helps the media's bottom line. And one of the first things they did, which I didn't pay attention to much when they were doing it, but has really interesting results. So, so they, they ran experiments where they took comment sections and they changed the like button to a respect button. And they found statistically that when you have a respect button, in the comment section instead of a like button, it transforms how people engage in that venue. Um, and you know, does it change the world? No, but, but it actually makes a difference. And, and I think we need to look for those kinds of nudges um, to make a difference. So. Microphone four. Microphone four. <laughs> Thank you. Um, Dottie Ricks from Vermont. Um, I have a process question. Um, I'm intrigued by your public citizen summits and then the whole cycle of that driving the budget and then holding people accountable for uh, objectives from that budget. It is, by the way, what the public schools use in Vermont. However, that's a captive audience. And what I want to know is um, how, uh, how do you get your database for your public citizen summits how do you um, select them so that they're 
representative do you do random selection and then how do you get them to participate yeah so um there, there is a field of practice called deliberative democracy that um, there is a raging, there are raging debates about that question um, in a very small nerdy world of deliberative democracy. Um, uh, so there's one camp which believes the only way you can do it well is the way you do polling, right? You, you, you randomly select um, a, a group of folks and you potentially give them a little bit of a small stipend in order to um, incentivize them to come to the table. Um, that's generally not the approach that, that I've used, right? What, what I've used in the past is, you know, old school community organizing, right? It's you have, you have organizers in the field who are um, trusted by different parts of the community and they're out there talking to people about why participating matters. And, and to me, the most, the most important way you get people to participate is you convince them that why they're participating is not just to produce a report that's gonna end up on a shelf, right? You need to be able to demonstrate to them that by coming together, you are actually going to make some kind of difference on something that matters to your life. And I think too much public process are forums and public input sessions and hearings that actually aren't going to, to lead to that. And so I think it's just as important to focus on kind of who's delivering the message and what are you saying and how, you know, all, all of those things for the actual outreach is important. It's more important for the folks who are making the decisions to actually be willing to listen. And so, you know, I think for those of us in, in that sense, for, for those of us who are in the role of bringing the public into the process, before we extend that invitation, we need to have confidence that the invitation is authentic and that mm -hmm. folks are going to be listened to and how we are conveying to folks why you should participate is actually the case, right? Thank you. Microphone five. Thank you. Mike Freed from Billings chapter of the league in Montana. Um, a somewhat indiscreet question as I heard you relate to sociological research and to journalism. I wondered where you felt that your own personal budget was adequate to deal with significant issues that you care about and where it was totally inadequate. Um, there's never enough money, right? Um, uh, you know, I think my, you know, so I, I, work, I work for the founder of eBay. He, he has a lot of money. Um, <laughs> Um, and, 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 you know, and cares deeply about our democracy and has made tremendous commitments um, uh, to that end. And the amount of money, even if you take all of it, is small relative to the needs that we're coming up against. And so, you know, I think, you know, for us, it's really, really important to find ways to reach out to others and, and bring more resources into this field. Um, you know, we, we regularly work with um, dozens of other foundations to try to align resources and bring more dollars um, to the, the underfunded field of political reform. Um, so I, I don't know that there's any part of this field that is funded well enough. Um, uh, and I, I think we need to find ways to make the case for, to those who have resources that for whatever other issues you care about, if you don't address these issues of democracy, you're not going to get what you need. Um, so I think we need to make that case. We have time for one last question, and so I'll go to microphone six. Thank you. Uh, and thank you, Lana Zamaro, League of Women Voters of Massachusetts, and the Concord Carlisle League, and by the way, the home of systems thinking. <laughs> so thank you for a plug for systems thinking. Um, I uh, am th thankful that you mentioned climate, climate science and uh, the deep dismay that those scientists must be feeling today, so thank you for your empathy. I'm wondering, uh, we also know about the pretty deliberate, well-funded campaign by ExxonMobil to fund uh, climate denial. Uh, I'm wondering if you think, and that's been, what, 30 years or so um, in, in operation, and in the spirit of trying to understand how we are where we are today uh, from a source in a beginning, 
Do you think there's any basis for believing that there is an equivalent sort of systematic effort around uh, eroding public trust in government? And, uh, or am I just paranoid? <laughs> <laughs> um, sometimes they're actually out to get you. Um, uh, <laughs> um, do I think there is a concerted effort to delegitimize government? That's I, been a long I, I think, standing. Long I, I mean, I, I think that's pretty well documented. Okay. Um, is, it, is it nefarious? Uh, yes or no, I, I think you could interpret it in different ways. I think, you know, from our, fa so I, I'm, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm a huge Hamilton junkie, the, the, the musical of folks. <laughs> Um, and so recently uh, read the, the full biography of Alexander Hamilton and um, was thinking a lot recently about how a lot of the conflicts that we are in today have been going on since the beginning of the Republic. Um, and one of those conflicts is about the size of government. Um, uh, and, you know, I, I, I don't want to, I, I think there is a tendency for folks to um, oversimplify the motives of, of advocates on the other side. Um, so I don't want to um, try to characterize why folks are, some, some believe um, very strongly that what we need is, is smaller government. I, I think, you know, I think at the end of the day what we need is smarter government. And, um, <laughs> and I think it's, it's hard to deny that over the course of the last um, uh, decade, there have been a number of deep failures of government to actually deliver for the public. Um, so it's not, you know, it's not surprising that people are deeply concerned. And where we see um, folks blatantly just taking down government um, out of an ideological agenda, I think we need to stand up for it, right? Um, so. But yeah, it, it's, a, it's a good question. Do you take interns? <laughs> <laughs> I've got five interns much. right now, so uh, yes. Joe, thank you so Great. much for joining us. Thank it's you. been fascinating. Thank you.